Good afternoon. Uh, very well welcome to all our panelists, our, the moderators, and all you participating in this expert meeting on trustworthy science in the public domain. I'm Natalie Halberg, a distinguished university professor for law and AI at the University of Amsterdam and chair of a KNW committee that is tasked to explore the impact of the COVID pandemic on scientists, scientific practice, and trust in science. Our committee was established by the um, KNW to take stock of the positive and negative effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on scientists, scientific practice, and trust in science, with a special attention to young academic and also the long-term consequences of the pandemic. And an important task for this committee is also to look forward and develop recommendations for retaining a momentum for positive change to our academic practices, but also ways of mitigating or remedying its negative consequences. This workshop today is the first in a series of four thematic workshops in which we explore what we as a committee identified as key themes in this context. For information on the other three workshops, please consult the KNW website, and maybe Eva would like to put also a link in the chat. For this meeting today, we invited a number of eminent experts that our moderators will introduce in a moment, but I would also like to take this opportunity to emphasize that all your opinion, suggestions, and questions matter greatly also when developing our recommendations. So please use the Q&A function to post a comment, a suggestion, or a question. If you have a question for a specific speaker, please start with the name of the speaker. We will do our best to address as many questions as possible today, and uh, all the input will be kept and used in the advisory trajectory. I have now the great pleasure to introduce today's moderators. Professor Hedwig de Molder, Professor of Language and Communication at the FU Amsterdam, and Professor Cyrus Modi, Professor of History of Science, Technology and Innovation at Maastricht University. Cyrus, I give the word to you. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, welcome, everyone. Great to have a good crowd with us today. In this first half of the webinar, we will be talking about the diagnosis. What do we know about public trust in science, or lack thereof, as it relates to the pandemic? Uh, this is a vibrant area of research across a number of disciplines, as represented very nicely by our uh, first group of speakers today. Uh, we'll start with uh, Anflor Schovink, senior researcher at the Rathenau Institute. Please, Anflor. Thank you very much, uh, Cyrus. Um, I will start, start with a short pitch um, about uh, the research we have been uh, doing. Um, so however plausible it may seem, it is incorrect to say that public trust in science is declining. There is no evidence for this. Every three years, the Rathenau Institute conducts a survey among a representative group of Dutch people polling their trust in science. This year, we held additional focus groups to find out, find out more about the reasoning of citizens when to trust science. Public trust in science has increased considerably from 7.07 .07 in 2018 to 7.42 in March 2021. This increase in trust is partly due to the corona crisis. 24% of the respondents state their trust in level has increased because of the pandemic. The main reason for this increase is the rapid development of the corona vaccines. On the other hand, 16% report, reports that their level of trust has decreased. This group often also refers to the speed with which the vaccines have been developed. They worry about its reliability and struggle with conflicting information or ambiguity. So what could, could scientists do to resolve this ambiguity? Well, having heated scientific debates in the talk shows damages public trust in science. Instead, Dutch people indicate that they want help to interpret conflicting information. Scientists must clarify scientific uncertainties and limitations of a study and explain why certain methods were chosen. Also, Dutch citizens highly appreciate verification and replication studies, whilst this is appreciated little by the scientific community. Would this convince the supporters of Viruswaarheid? No, something else is going on here. 
These people actually disagree with government policies. In a corona crisis, the government has relied heavily on scientific insights, and don't get me wrong, this is wise. However, it is up to politicians to make the normative choices. They must determine to what extent a measure, for example, introducing the 3G pass in higher education, has enough expected benefits, reducing the spread of the virus, to outweigh its costs, making access difficult for non-vaccinated students. They must ultimately account for these choices, the politicians. Sometimes politicians, however, hide behind science. They claim that scientists dictate their policy. We have no other choice but to introduce the 3G pass in higher education. This is never the case. There's always a different balance of interest possible. Maybe using the 3G pass in shops on this Black Friday would have had the same benefits, but with different costs for different actors. In these cases, public dissatisfaction does not focus on the implicit policy choice, it, but it turns instead to the scientific results that underlie them. We see time and again that once the political considerations and their scientific underpinnings can no longer be clearly separated from each other, the protest swells. Then the science used by the politician is challenged, the pseudoscience is put into, is put into position, and there is a polarization of views. So, in short, I would argue scientists should not take the seats of politicians, even if they're tempted to do so. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Anflor, and many thanks for uh, keeping to the time. Uh, next, we have Jeroen Harambam, a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute for Media Studies at uh, KU Leuven. Please, Jeroen. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so my name is Jago Narambam, and I'm an interdisciplinary sociologist. Uh, my research is on conspiracy theories and public disputes over truth. And I'm going to uh, share my screen to highlight this little presentation. So based on my ethnographic research in the Dutch conspiracy world, I distinguish ideotypically three main critiques of science which foster their distrust. And the first is uh, the dogmatic materialism of modern science. These people argue how the scientific method obscures and denies everything that the scientific method cannot measure or observe, uh, leaving out paranormal phenomena, the supernatural, unexplored. Um, the second main argument is the close connection with vested interests. They say that science claims to be objective, but has close connections with big pharma, uh, big agriculture, etc., but also with government. So, for example, what we've seen uh, right in the presentation before, when scientists are taking the seats of politicians and legitimizing government policies, science is even more distrusted. But the third main reason why science is always distrusted is the experienced social distance to scientists. Many people argue how they cannot relate or identify with scientists and their language and cultural symbols differ greatly, making it hard for these people to trust them. Um, in the same way, their experiential knowledge is denied by science as legitimate. So what can we do to foster uh, distrust or to foster trust again in science? And what we see very clearly is that more facts and more information doesn't work. But explaining better what we do and how we do it and what makes good knowledge uh, foster is important. So I think I distinguish here as well three different levels since the distrust of science is multidimensional. We need to also think of different ways of uh, regaining trust. So this relates to how scientists are operating in public and in everyday interactions. So first line professionals, doctors, but also people in public health institutes, etc., play an important role here, but also communicatively. We always think that science and scientific findings are boring to uh, convey, but I would take great uh, inspiration by, for example, David Attenborough, who shows with his beautiful documentaries how climate change is real and man-made. Uh, and the third is more institutionally. How can we organize science differently on the one hand to include citizens in our knowledge production better, but also to make it more independent with respect to corporate and uh, government uh, intrusions. All right, this would be it. Thank you. Thanks, Jeroen. Um, finally, we have Bastian Rutschens, Assistant Professor of, at the Psychology Research Institute of the University of Amsterdam and Director of the Psy Psy Lab there. Please, Bastian. Uh, thanks, Iris, and uh, thank you all for attending. Um, so I would 
like to briefly state that indeed, as Anna Floor already mentioned, that trust in science generally is quite high uh, in the Netherlands and many comparable countries. Um, that being said, certain domains of science, uh, you know, the hot topics in, in public debates like climate change, climate science, vaccination, genetic modification, but also evolution, um, face a bit of a different uh, uh, problem here. So, so there is uh, domain specific skepticism, meaning that while trust in science generally is high, uh, specific uh, domains of science uh, suffer from uh, public skepticism. And uh, even though maybe across the population, the skepticism is not that high, we do see that small pockets of groups within society can be quite vocal about, uh, about their skepticism. And this can be problematic. Uh, two examples of this are, for example, uh, are climate, uh, climate science and vaccination. So with climate science, even though most people, uh, 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 most people in the general public now believe that climate uh, change is real, there's still a small and sometimes vocal minority uh, that um, uh, raises the voices about climate science. And this has consequences for implementing measures that are needed to combat uh, global warming. Uh, if you consider vaccination, which is of course very relevant to the uh, current discussion, uh, we now know that um, uh, certain groups, not only uh, uh, the classic sort of Bible Belt skeptics, but also like modern uh, city dwellers with an interest in spirituality uh, uh, are now sort of joining the ranks of the uh, uh, vaccination skeptics. Um, and of course, this can have uh, this can have consequences for vaccination uh, coverage uh, across the country. Um, and what I think is really important, this is also something that Jaron uh, focused on, is that science rejection has long been thought to be uh, caused by a lack of correct information. This view, however, is now largely outdated. We know that various ideologies and worldviews uh, play a way more important role in uh, predicting science rejection than, uh, uh, than a lack of knowledge. So we need to consider the fact that simply providing people with more information will not solve this issue. We have to think about you know, what type of ideology, what type of worldview underlies a certain uh, uh, manifestation of science skepticism and try to uh, uh, act accordingly. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Uh, thank you to all three of our panelists. We now have about uh, 20 minutes for discussion. So uh, please start putting your questions into the Q&A and um, some of them the speakers will be able to answer in the Q&A itself. Uh, others I'll draw their attention to. Uh, but maybe we can just start with a, a question that I'll pose to, to all three of you. Uh, so an interesting tension I see in all three presentations uh, is between independence and responsiveness of science, right? Uh, Anflo's uh, Rattanau report emphasizes that public trust in science depends heavily upon the perception that scientists are independent. Yet science policy and science funding organizations across the world, certainly in the Netherlands, increasingly demand that scientists be responsible and responsive to the public and that they collaborate with civil society partners, including industry. Uh, and, and of course, such calls have become even more urgent during the pandemic. Is there a tension between that desire for scientists to be independent and the desire for them to be responsive? And if so, has the pandemic uh, exacerbated that tension? I'm I'm happy to to have a first response. Uh, it's um, we uh, the the Rattenau has indeed exactly focused on this relationship between between policy. Um, financed research and, and scienti scientists performing this research. And um, we were especially interested in the perception of the public on this relationship. And um, to be honest, um, citizens are very aware of, the, of this balance, of this need for a balance. So they, they yes, of course, they say that independence is, is, is important and especially in formulating the, the conclusions and the, the results of your research. But they also realize that um, it is, there, there might be some, some uh, contact needed, for example, to, to formulate the research question in a, in, a, in a way to help the policymakers later with their policy problem. So they are, they are very much aware of this need for a balance and independence is a very important um, feature, but they do realize, people realize that there is 
in, in other stages of a research process, um, th there needs to be some, some, some contact between policymakers and researchers. So that's the public's perception of that is actually quite, um, I would say, um, fine grained. Yeah, and to add to that, I think like the sort of the objectivity ideal uh, that we have as scientists and that is sort of the PR of science uh, conflicts very much with everyday uh, arrangement about how science is financed. Uh, and I see in my research, especially with all different kinds of conspiracy theorists, whether they go against 5G and the telecommunications outro uh, and how that research is funded directly by telecom giants uh, or the same in the pharmaceutical industry or with food and drug authorities. Um, so I think the, uh, this, so, this yeah, brings a, sort of a, a very complex problem to science because we also need funding in a way. So who's paying for it? And I think what we uh, forget to do is to explain also and maybe introduce more barriers from the financers towards uh, scientists. And if we can explain better how that uh, sort of uh, yeah, guarantees some form of uh, independence towards the, 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 supply, the financial suppliers, because otherwise every day saying whoever pays decides goes and that scientific knowledge that is fully funded by industry is really distrusted. And that brings also the more uh, complicated arrangements of science and enterprise uh, into more distrust. And to add to this, uh, we also saw that a personal negative um, um, experience with science or scientists um, ha also has an influence on people's trust in science in general. So although I definitely agree with Bastian's um, uh, insights that this is a heterogeneous um, a topic and there is our domain specific um, uh, skepti skeptists, um, we do see that once someone has been, has had some kind of negative experience with researchers being influenced or they have seen how sometimes how things can go wrong that does influence their their perception of of sci scientists in general yeah I, I i agree on the floor i think there is there is of course a, a relationship between general trust in science and and, and these types of uh, um, um, yeah things that 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 people sort of encounter in daily life however i do think that i mean i don't I have never met uh, someone who's skeptical about uh, cosmologists or theoretical physicists. They, these people might exist, of course, but but they're probably a more rare breed than <laughs> people that are skeptical about, say, vaccination uh, um, uh, vaccination scientists, uh, to call it like that. Uh, so I think there is a there is there, it is important to think about this, the fact that some of these uh, domains of science are more susceptible to public skepticism because. Uh, people have a more strongly formed, yeah, sort of pre-existing attitude about these topics because these topics touch uh, on your personal life, right? So vaccination is something that that concerns us all. Uh, cosmology, maybe a little less so. So I think that's important to uh, distinguish. Maybe I can um, collect some of the questions that have been uh, gathering in the Q and A. So we have. Uh, one it says, uh, what are the most important things scientists can do or change to enter into dialogue with civil society? I would add to that maybe the what also can the institutions of science, such as the Canada, do? Uh, and another question: Should public engagement and communicating without scientific jargon be mandatory part of researcher training? Uh, and then on top of that, also, how can one provide more insight uh, without involving more facts or more information? Yeah, many different uh, questions if I jump in right away. I think like uh, one of the examples that, for example, KNAV did a very good job was the science agenda where all kinds of uh, members of the public could send in their, their questions that they wanted very much to be answered by science. And I think this generated a lot of research programs that very much uh, aligned with public interests. Uh, and I think this is one of the great like recent examples of how we try to include uh, the concerns of everyday citizens uh, in scientific knowledge production. But in many ways, I fully agree that we uh, are very like institutionally incentivized to be very much in the public debate and to explain and that science has like sort of 
uh, little offices where uh, everyday people can just go to uh, with their concerns and their questions. And you see the different institutes, especially of, uh, uh, yeah, for example, technological institutes of the, uh, I have one example here of the telecommunication uh, authorities that have like a very local office where people can come with their concerns about 5G, about electromagnetic radiation. And I think these uh, very low key and everyday uh, sort of places where people can go to with their concerns and encounter scientists are very important and we should invest much more in those uh, social arrangements where people can come to. And I would, I definitely agree with Jaron, but I would go even further. I would say it's not uh, one of my um, research topics is also public engagement with science. Um, so I would say um, the the NWA, the Nationale Wetenschapsagenda, was a good step in the in the right direction. But I would say it's definitely not enough because it's still um, there was still a portal where uh, the questions were selected and then rephrased, and that was all done by set, uh, scientists. So there was this whole kind of large in-between step between the scientists and the, the, the public and the scientists. And I would definitely argue for more direct one-on-one -on -one contact. Um, and also not just in, um, in you know, questions and then, okay, we'll go, go ahead and, and go figure out what to do with it, but also to really engage the public in how to then formulate the research question. And then maybe the, the conducting of science is of course, it's a, it's a craft in itself as well. So it's not that public doesn't have to be part of everything, but more um, intense contact rather than just more, more people, more questions, more public engagement is not, um, is not always better. It should be about meaningful engagement. That's what I would argue. Yeah, maybe to briefly add to that, this is something that Jaron also touched upon is, is the social distance uh, that many people experience to science. So a recent uh, survey, uh, which was done globally, showed that around 50% of people across the globe basically have no clue what science is. They can't define science. They also don't know any scientists. And they don't know how science could, could ever benefit them, right? So this is, this is a huge sort of psychological distance that people experience to science. And we've been looking in, in recent research at the extent to which psychological distance is indeed a sort of a predictor of distrust in science. And this is indeed the case. So over and beyond all kinds of ideological constraints or religious beliefs or what have you, we see that over and beyond these concerns, um, uh, psychological distance does seem to predict distrust in science. So if you can sort of bring science closer to the individual, uh, you know, along the lines that Anna Flora and Jaron just, just, just talked about. I think this will actually be very helpful in order to, uh, to combat uh, public distrust in science. We saw it even happening in our focus groups. We had one special focus group with people selected for their low trust in science. Um, and they didn't know in advance that we were going to talk about science. So they were a bit shocked when they heard that because they were like, but I don't know anything and I don't know any people in, in universities and it, they were really a bit scared of it. And then we just said, no, but we are just interested, genuinely interested in your in your opinions. We talked about, the, about it for two hours with them. And then there were actually people saying like, okay, I feel like I know a little bit more now what's going on, even though the cases we discussed were actually fictive, um, which we told them, <laughs> but even just, you know, talking about it and discussing it and having their opinions heard helped people in in feeling in in feeling a bit this this distance actually decreasing yes that was really uh, interesting <laughs> maybe if i can add one more thing because i couldn't get to that uh, in my presentation um so I, I think what for example happened in a number of countries in europe uh amongst which is the uh climate convention by macron uh, so also to include citizens in uh, the development of policy in which science is normally the guiding factor, uh, I think is a very important way to have a, like a sort of big uh, diversity of people included uh, and also able to uh, ask their questions and like have this interaction with scientists and policymakers uh, is, in my opinion, also a great way to institutionalize this uh, politically. As long as you actually do something with 
the policy. Absolutely. The, the if it's code. being put aside, that's the worst. <laughs> yeah, that was kind of what happens yeah. in most cases, but okay. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> That's a great uh, segue, actually, because uh, we have a question in the Q&A about how uh, the Netherlands relates to the UK in terms of uh, societal trust in science. But I wonder if we couldn't uh, broaden that even further and, and just ask about how the Netherlands relates to this as a, as a global phenomenon. Um, are there places that are doing interesting things, interesting experiments with uh, uh, science, scientists' engagement with the public? Um, are there aspects of this phenomenon where the, the Netherlands really should um, promote itself as, as a world leader? Awkward silence. No, I don't know. Um, I don't. I don't think that we're particularly uh, part of the leading group in Europe. But I see a lot of uh, European-funded uh, groups that really want to change science communication and science uh, engagement or public engagement with science. Uh, so I think all over uh, the EU, this is sort of very much sponsored, but I wouldn't know anything of the, the UK and how that compares, like the sort of a comparative research in, in, in public engagement. Maybe Anna Flora has more information on that. I do a little, uh, especially on um, medical, in the medical domain. So patient involvement is traditionally um, quite uh, far ahead in public engagement terms, um, because also the stakeholders are, of course, very clear. It's the patients and their and the people around them who have very high stakes in uh, in research. And in the UK and the Netherlands, actually, it's quite um, well advanced, I would say, uh, compared to other European and other countries um, worldwide. Um, so the NHS is quite um, advanced in in organizing this, and in in the Netherlands also. So. Uh, okay, um, so uh, quite a few questions in the Q&A have to do with, um, yeah, disagreements among scientists. So uh, scientific debate is, of course, um, an essential element of science. Many scientists would say that that's how you arrive at, at better understanding is through debate. And yet this also seems to play an important role in scientific distrust of science. Um, uh, connected to that, and, and the num quite a number of the Q&As are uh, pointing to this, is that uh, sometimes the different sides in scientific debates are not always operating in good faith. So uh, how is that an aspect of, of, this, uh, of this phenomenon? Well, I think uh, partially this has to do with, um, you know, public knowledge uh, um, and insight into how science operates, as, as, as already part of the question, in a sense. Uh, so, 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 if, if, so many people don't really know how science functions. And this means that when scientists sort of are more part of the public debate, uh, you know, appear on talk shows, uh, on TV, et cetera, and have these discussions, then uh, people might think, oh, well, there's, the scientists don't even agree. You know, how can we then even um, uh, trust who's right? If there's not even the agreement amongst uh, the scientists themselves. And this, uh, I think, has to do again with um, public uh, sort of, yeah, knowing as a, as, as a member of the public how science functions. And I think there's a world to win here where we, uh, uh, yeah, basically just educate uh, people better starting early, I think in, in childhood on how science functions, how science operates, what science is and that science should be sort of built on these disagreements and debates and, and a sort of re, uh, uh, considering of theory, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's, that's, I think one aspect. The other aspect maybe is that scientists should probably sometimes be a little bit mindful about the topic on which they engage in debates uh, uh, in, in public arenas, such as on talk shows. So there's, everybody knows these examples where scientists sort of, uh, sort of mingle in debates, which are maybe a little bit uh, broader than their own expertise. And that might not always be such a good idea. And this again, I think points to the distinction that Anna Flor also made between policies that build on science and debates about these policies and the science itself. So the data and the scientific knowledge that can inform these uh, policies. 
Yeah, so I think that there, there's two sides to this uh, story. On the one hand, I think we should, there's probably, uh, and I think uh, Bastian can also say, uh, confirm that, that there's different people and how they deal with ambiguity. Um, and I think this is like also uh, important to find out sort of which groups in society need sort of a solid, a fixed understanding of, of reality in which people can actually allow more ambiguity and debate and disagreement, etc. Um, but the other thing is also the PR of science, which is still very much dominated by this sort of uh, quest for certainty, while organized doubt is very much part of the scientific practice as well. And I think that side of it is very little communicated to the public when we speak about what we do as scientists. And this is also confirmed by politicians who are saying we need to trust science or follow science as is it as if it is one uniform, uh, very stable category of, 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 of knowledge. Um, so I think these two matters to be more precise with which kind of publics need more certainty and more and, and which publics actually demand more uh, depth and complexity and, and, and can al allow ambiguity. Uh, and we need to uh, present ourselves differently uh, to also emphasize this this organized doubt that is very much of our practice. Yes. Yes, I completely agree with both of you. Um, and I think also in the now in the COVID pandemic, and especially, of course, in the beginning, when there was so little known of this virus, and there was still so much uncertainty, um, that was when a lot of these debates, which are usually taking place um, in uh, papers and then uh, responses to papers and then retractions and then it's like that that's where the generally or normally where the academic debate takes place of course and on conferences um and that was now all kind of taken to the public arena and um it was not only on the talk shows it also actually had effect on public policy so especially with the mouth mask um, debates in the Netherlands, whether it was actually effective or whether it was not, and then it was, you know, going back and forth. And that was especially in, that was exactly in the time when we held the focus groups, and people got very confused simply because they felt like, indeed, science was supposed to give the answer, and it uh, uh, suddenly it didn't, and there was like this doubt, and and people simply didn't know, and that was. I agree with Yaron that that's something people don't expect of scientists. They kind of expect 100% certainty, which is simply super impossible. <laughs> We're almost out of time, but maybe one last and methodological question that's come up, but can participatory action research and community-based research approaches improve understanding and acceptance among the general public? Yes, I'm a great fan of uh, power research method so yes i would definitely simply agree but uh, maybe Aron has more to say about this no yeah the same here i fully agree not only because it's important to sort of be able to tap on uh different kinds of expertise and experiences of people as well but also to yeah this is these are perfect ways to bridge the social distance between uh scientists and everyday people and their concerns so um yes fully yes and there's so little happening in that yeah, it's important to then when you include the public, then to also include like a diverse group of, of publics. So um, to actually bridge this social distance, then you also need to reach the people who are furthest away from you. And that might be the hardest people to reach and the hardest people to to um, motivate, but it is definitely worthwhile. Wonderful, very free, flow, uh, free flowing discussion. This was uh, really interesting. Uh, we now take a 10 minute break. And when we come back, uh, Hedwig will uh, moderate the second half of our uh, panel uh, discussion today. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. We're back again. And uh, for another uh, part of this meeting, which is, uh, I'm, I'm sure it will be fascinating and exciting because what we are going to do is not only to look at um, how come that there is so much contestation in the area of science, but also what can we do together to make science not only more reliable, but especially more meaningful to society. Um, and to build credible science that also can contribute to uh, the solving of societal problems. And for that, we have invited three uh, speakers. 
um, uh, which will join, who will join us in the discussion. And we will make a step not only from looking at science education and science engagement as a way to, uh, into acceptance of science or more reliable science, but to go beyond that and to look what is the role of values, what is the role of emotions, uh, and what is there beyond the facts that we should address uh, for this issue. Uh, the first speaker is Ulrike Feld. She is Professor of Science and Technology at the University of Vienna. Ulrike, please take the floor. Mm. So I've put all my wisdom in one slide. Uh, so that shows already something. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I will try to outline a bit where I see our potentials to act and would start with the fact that I find it interesting that COVID actually is a lens through which we can see pre-existing cracks and inequalities and fractures in our societies. So it's not something that comes at astonishment but has to be seen as much deeper. And so when the virus arrives in the middle of our society, we first reacted by analogical reasoning and we tried to put it into different boxes like it's like a flu or is it like this or like that so we had a lot of educated guessing but what was interesting to me is we all looked at the virus and we never in the beginning at least it was less the complexity of how virus becomes part of our society and i think this only starts gradually and this will define the role we will have to take the second point is um so we go in the middle. Now I would like to move. So science has been a cleaned in a way as an object. And we looked and expert panels were mainly epidemiologists or any medical people or biologists, but we did not include social scientists in the beginning, at least not in the Austrian context. Now from there, we move up to first the political realm and then to the media and the public where I think we can do something. So in politics, we have to understand that there are traditional ways how science relates to politics. And actually we saw very nicely in the Corona uh, crisis that there is no tradition of this interaction. And I think this has to be made an explicit topic from both sides to think about how one could build relations of distance and closeness at the same time. And I think that is something very important to do. Politics has to keep the responsibility for the decision and science can be a decision support. And I think these different roles need to be a kind of defined and maybe debated beyond the crisis. On the other side, I found it interesting to look at the, at the media because the media started a kind of what I call a biopedagogical exercise teaching a society, a whole society of how to see together the pandemic. And what happened is interesting in the beginning, this worked very well in Austria. So they explained what a curve is and how to flatten the curve and what numbers mean. But then what happened is that we changed the vision every two, three weeks. And that was something that puzzled people. And they did not explain very well um, how that worked. And I took one commentary out of a newspaper where somebody in July, they told me only run the R number counts and it's currently below one, so no problem. In August, they told me it's hospital the hospitalizations that count and they are very low. In September, they told me it's only intensive care that counts. In October, they told me it's the death numbers and in November, they told me it's an excess of mortality. And that caused a lot of confusion about what do we look at when we look at um, a pandemic? And I think this is something to talk together with citizens, with scientists, with politicians. Then we can move up and say, so how does that come that it's so complicated to handle that? And that has already been said, it's the way how does science know? And actually it's highly black boxed all along its way. We don't know about processes and practices. We only know about outcomes. And what I found most amazing is the introduction that models know everything about us and people know virtually nothing about models. And I found that extremely interesting how, how to deal with that and how to make our processes and practices much more transparent and much more debatable in that sense. Because uncertainty as said already is, is there and it needs to become part also of public debate because it's about learning and about collectively learning. And that brings me down to the left side on the corner, namely about relations and responsibilities. 
there cannot be a naive relation as was often done from politics um, between knowledge and action. And there you see very clearly, you have these politicians stepping up, press uh, information by press conference, and then you have the protests in the street. But the point is that there is no connection anymore between understanding political action, scientific knowledge, and public, uh, public uptake. And I think this needs to be addressed in a much more clear manner. And so relations and responsibilities, so knowledge has to meet worldviews and values. And I think this has been essential because it's all about balancing. When we take legal steps, it's all about the size of if, if there is a kind of a correspondence between the action and the knowledge, and that has never been really debated. And finally, it's the question of individuals versus collectives, which is all the time there. And this is also quite interesting because medical speak about collective numbers, and then we speak about individual action. And that's something we also need to relate to, which then ties very nice up with the question of how does solidarity, how is solidarity then imagined? if you are the individual that needs to be responsible and how does that relate to trust? And I think I would like to stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ulrika. Um, I would now like to give the floor to Anna Dolnova, Professor of Political Sociology at the University of Vienna. Anna. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this interesting round. I am going to share my slides as well. Uh, I, um, and I think that my pitch concerns actually a call, a societal call to break with the dominant understanding of emotions that we have as Western democratic societies, if you will. And I think that we can operate that break if we move from providing expertise toward an interpretation of what expertise means. Public framings of expertise, both in media and policy meetings, usually recall dominant knowledge structures, gender hierarchies, and all sorts of cultural aspects of why we trust uh, some experts rather than the other. Within that perspective, we've seen in the late modern societies that expertise is largely being framed as neutral and non-emotional. We usually overlook that our common understanding of emotions co-produce this framing of non-emotional science and non-emotional expertise, because these understandings impact what is regarded as the legitimate knowledge to be taken into account when expert solutions are produced or put on the table, and who has the right to take part in such debates. So I'm going to take now a few seconds to show you two such dominant understandings of emotions, which is on the one hand overreaction. So this notion that emotions are something radical, overreacting to the problem. And this common, the other common understanding is that these are just personal feelings. It's just your subjective, chaotic, naive feeling. And I'm going to show you how this has affected actually our way to deal with pandemic and proposed policy expertise solutions to pandemic eventually. So the pandemic crisis all over the Western world is in the hand of individuals. So resilience and capacity to act are presented as individual ability with no relation to societal resources. And there has been already mentioned about solidarity and trust. And we've seen that the individual ability has been much highlighted over solidarity, empathy, and other societal resources solutions, if you will. Then also there has been a whole large focus on pathologies and the radical and rather than on the structures that might eventually lead to such pathologies. As a result of this, we have a limited space for discussing the structural causes of how people feel about the pandemic, because how we feel about the pandemic has social, economic, and cultural background that we actually need to address in order to understand why emotions are produced in response to particular instruments and solutions. So in that background, or against that background, we can see that political instruments that deal with the pandemic are necessarily limited. The example of that, the best example, are the psychosocial states of citizen that are presented as a collateral damage to the pandemic and weakness rather than a product of it, or actually something which should be perhaps uh, highlighted. Also, there's no room for de dealing with contradictory emotions. And I would like to highlight here the anxiety of many people of both getting the virus and getting a vaccine or the frustration over yet another lockdown, but also the frustration over that this pandemic is not over yet. So where does this lead us? I'm proposing what I call an interpretive screening of emotions, which is a screening that each of you can do when you open a newspaper or listen to experts. 
The first uh, part of that is that emotions are always on both sides of the conflict. Emotions and emotional means usually emphasis of values and beliefs of your opponent. So you wanna highlight something you don't like and you are opposed to. Second, emotions have always gender, ethnicity and culture. So it's worthy to make a test what would be different if there's a change in the person or the change in the policy area. Would I perceive the emotions still in the same way? And last not but not least, I think we should be aware of this emotion versus fact binary oppos uh, opposition because there are uh, understanding facts is always mediated by emotions and there are usually facts on both sides of the conflict. They are just labeled in different ways which are related to what I just said about our common understandings of emotions. So that's it and I thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, uh, Anna, for this great uh, exposition of what emotions can mean to us. Um, Martin Heyer, uh, Professor Urban Futures at Utrecht University. The floor is yours. Okay. Thanks, uh, Hedwig, and uh, hello to you all. Um, uh, to add to this uh, wonderful panel, uh, a few thoughts. First of all, I think it's important to reflect on the, on the nature of what authority really is. Uh, so we, we speak about how to regain authority, but how do, what is authority? Now, authority, in particular with expert, uh, is always an assumption that if you're sort of a professor, you have that, right? Because you are a professor, but that's a sort of a de jure de, uh, idea of uh, authority. And what we actually see in else in the COVID pandemic is that it is about a de facto uh, authority. So you have to always regain it in a communication. And I suppose that, that implies that in that communication, we should invest much more an understanding of what it does to people who are, are pitched as being an expert. Because I think that the, what, what we see a lot of evidence of is that there is a, an assumption of how experts behave and many experts then start to behave accordingly. So, so what you see in the media happening is that people that are pitch this an expert then are much more uh, sort of giving a certainty about what they do than they would normally do within a university co a context. Eh? So in the sense, they are framed. They are framed du moment that they start to speak as experts within sort of seminars like this, you know, not hiding your uncertainty, emphasizing the conditionality of your knowledge and so forth. They are not so very likely to uh, be invited back in, in the media service. So that's a, also an answer to the question that Hong Tong uh, raised in, in the chat. However, I suppose an, a thing that, that hampers an effective communication of experts is that they think that they are there to tell the facts. But then of course the question is, what facts? John Forrester, the uh, urban planner from, uh, from Ithaca, at some point said there's a difference between matters of fact, so factual uh, evidence of something, and the facts that matter. And I suppose that is where I would say lies the solution, that we put more emphasis on the facts that matter to people. So what we need to do in the next phase is invite, invite new relationships with the audience, with different audiences that are actually able to make a reciprocal relationship between uh, the expert and, and people. Now, there is my big worry because I feel that we're going entirely the wrong way within universities. We're not going towards transdisciplinarity, but we have all sort of ethical codes where we have these consent forms and so forth that should clear us legally. What we should have instead is an ethics of reciprocity so that you say what your commitment is to the people that you need to get your knowledge and also always allow them back in with their concerns and their questions. And then things like uh, uh, citizens for a mini public, publics are indeed, as Joran already said earlier, important experiments because these are the fora where, you, where people could actually decide who to invite and whose evidence they want to hear in a particular conversation. And I hope we can pick up on this in the conversation to come. 
Thank you very much, uh, Martin, for this. Um, I think we have uh, three very nice uh, contributions. And what I would like to do is make things very concrete, maybe not uh, the most um, popular uh, ex experiment under scientists, but um, uh, I would like to ask uh, to re-raise the question again, what can we do together to make these recommendations, which you all uh, put uh, on the slides and uh, talked about, how can we put them into practice? And uh, I would like to, to start first with uh, the first point that Ulrike raised and which also came up, I think, um, in the first uh, part of this session, how to build both distance and closeness uh, between science and politics, between experts and citizens. And so on the one hand, you want to keep your independence or something which, uh, uh, so uh, that it is not clouded, uh, that you're, um, uh, your, just, uh, your judgments are not clouded and independent and objective. On the other hand, we really miss, and that's also what we see in current society, the closeness uh, to citizens uh, to, uh, uh, and also the government through science uh, and scientific underpinnings misses that closeness. So I would like to ask uh, all three of you, uh, how can we make that concrete? I can give it a try. Yeah. I mean, I think this is the biggest question you can ask. There is no bigger one. I'm sorry to say that because that's a cultural change, actually. Actually, what I found so interesting to observe is, is that in such a over such a long period, I never have seen um, the kind of reordering of relationships around one subject between politics, science, media, etc. This has never existed before, not in my lifetime on none of the subjects. Because climate change comes in waves like that and you are differently affected, people seem to be differently affected. COVID in very interesting ways has affected us so directly. So this relationship has been much more challenged. So what I think, I mean, there have been questions also, I mean, media have had a very nice, very clearly entrenched way of reporting about science and scientists have been feeding that in a, in a way so these uh, high end news uh, sure answers about things and for the first time this was clearly visible that even in very good institutions scientists would not agree on things and they would not publicly agree and so I think what we need to do is actually and this is a long term project this is not something that you can solve by just defining it in a way open up the way we, we pretend knowledge is being produced. And I think this is something that is extremely interest, important and not assume people are only interested in fancy news and shiny papers, et cetera, et cetera. But this has then to do, and I think uh, Martin pointed to that, the way we run institutions, the way universities are run, at least in my country, are very much along classical indicators what do you do? And it's not kind of rewarded to have this kind of more open engagement with society. You don't have within the time structures that academia gives, there is nothing foreseen as a space where you can do that kind of work. And I think this is, for yeah. my view, essential that within academic institutions we start and not poem to media or to policy, but to kind of really start and think within institutions to, to not only call something third mission, but to do something that is like a third mission and not, not only kind of counting how often you met someone or whether a newspaper wrote about you or so. This cannot be the, the indicator. So that would be my answer. Yeah, thank you. So um, maybe a question uh, to Anna, what would this mean if you had, so Rick is pointing out that um, maybe the, the relation has never been so tense eh, as we are, experience, uh, are experiencing now. Uh, it is important that we become more transparent about how knowledge is being produced, also with a view to what is the role of science, what is the role of vested interests, eh, which is one of the reasons why people doubt certain products of science, but what is the role of emotions uh, according to you? 
Thank you. I think this is a great point that could be summarized actually by your initial question about the distance and closeness, because we have observed in 2020 a very large co open call to emotions, to emotionality, people fearing the virus, people fearing to be alone. And one could argue, okay, so at last the modern society have acknowledged that we are emotional human beings and that there are things that we need, that we need to talk about these emotions. However, I think in the past 20 months, I have never seen more distant way to deal with emotions than it was. Because we still tend to think that our feelings are, while they are individual, that they are actually homogenous for each of us in a society. Mm -hmm. so we have the same, we, are, we, we expect to have the same fear or that, that our neighbors have the same fear and same emotions about a thing. And if they don't, that something's wrong with them. Mm -hmm. Do not think about the social aspects of that. Perhaps we might have the conditions of living so unbearable that we might have a more uh, different emotions that come in in dealing with the pandemic, because maybe a lockdown in a villa at the seaside is different than a lockdown in some kind of suburb in a very small flat. And that, so revising our language of emotions in two ways. So revising, acknowledging that there are societal, economic and cultural aspects of how people feel and socialize within their emotions, but also revising the language of emotions as something which actually disqualifies you from public discussions. That's the other thing we've seen. We mm -hmm. see yet another pinpointing of, of people like let's take the anti-vaxxers as the most obvious example. It doesn't matter, or this is not the debate, like whether you endorse their statements or not, you can criticize them, but the way, but you can't, you, I think we see a way of portraying them through an emotional language that is not accurate because it's not that people that are getting the vaccine would not be emotional. It's not that scientists are not emotional. It's not that politicians are not emotional. So this play with emotions and emotional is an extremely political way that actually, I would say, uh, deprives us or limits us in uh, dealing with the problem. Mm -hmm. Because for example, we are not able to deal with the ambivalence of the evidence that lies in front of us. Ulrike felt shows that, showed that nicely that we've seen a very closely scientists working on a new virus and we've seen that people are not actually uh, cannot agree upon how it goes where it goes and all this language of ambivalence is partly also the language of emotions we're mm -hmm. not able to accept subjectivity contradiction and ambivalence in our political or expertise mm -hmm. language and i think we should revise that and when we revise that when we acknowledge that emotions are everywhere and we just need to analyze them where they come from and where they lead to we might be on a better way to find a more equitable and more democratic solutions. And that my last point to that would be, I think we can see that also in the way uh, experts commissions have been appointed in this pandemic. Mm -hmm. That psychosocial well-being, as I said in my, in my pitch, was largely underrepresented. However, mm -hmm. this is what stays. One day, if the virus is gone, people's minds and people's souls will stay and the devastation that has been done to some groups will actually be there much longer. And yeah. the way we deal with that, I think, shows very nicely this need of revision. Right. Yeah. So I hear you say that it's really important to uh, keep acknowledging the diversity in emotions. Eh? So both individual and collective and eh, so not only individual, uh, but also to and I think that is a big challenge, how to translate this diversity of emotions institutionally. Eh? So it may be I, I can recognize and I can acknowledge the emotions with my neighbor, but it is different for institutions to acknowledge the importance of emotions and emotions of course also signpost important values being at stake. Huh? Uh, so maybe I could ask Martin um, and uh, uh, I see a link but maybe you don't with your ethics of reciprocity. Huh? So um, uh, how can we, uh, so there is a lot of talk huh, that for science to become more meaningful, for society to become more reliable, we should not only turn to science education and science engagement. Eh? So that's one thing. We should not only uh, include more people, but we should also turn to something which seems to lie beyond science, but it doesn't, and that is values and emotions. So how to incorporate that in the institutions that deal with science? Yeah, well, thanks for that. For that uh question. 
Well, I suppose some, my answer would also be, you know, where do these emotions come from? And they often come from a feeling of lack of power and, mm -hmm. or power difference. And, and one of my worries is that in this COVID debate, you seem to sort of go along with the framing of a rational debate and then people who, who believe in, in, in complot theories, conspiracy theories. But that, that would actually do away with all critical social science. Because, I mean, it's not as if there is no vested interest issue in the COVID crisis, right? I mean, there is, uh, there is a deep concern with, with big pharma in this. I mean, it's another thing to say that you have from this was paid or whatever, right? but there is a vested interest issue. So we completely seem to be uh, going along with this rational versus conspiracy theory. And that, that I think is not helpful. So some of these, these emotions come, are related to power differential issues. And there we may be able to do something also in ethical terms. So the, the, top, the issue that I raised uh, with, these, with the current sort of wave of ethics in terms of all these consent forms and so forth, I find deeply problematic. And the alternative would be well, much more something like uh, the organic intellectual, somebody who says, you know, I'm devoted to say neighborhood development. And for the next four years, I'm going to research this neighborhood. Here, I want to sort of almost sign a contract that for four years, me and my research group, we will be here. We won't immediately leave because that is what I hear people say. If you go into a neighborhood like Overvecht in Utrecht, that what they immediately say is, when do you leave? Why? Because they are they have a flux of academics that go there for an excursion. Sometimes they even call it an urban safari. Eh? So just, if, just to talk about emotions, what, how, what is it to be seen as, as an animal? And so that whole attitude that we have as academics, that we extract data from people, rather than that we build up a reciprocal relationship in which people could also add their concerns to our research agenda. I mean, that is uh, the obvious way to, to improve on that. And another element where I'm deeply concerned about is that we allow far too much space to communication. So we're now going to skill our experts to become effective communicators. I, please not. Yeah? I would like them to be effective in deliberation, in turn-taking, in, 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 in hearing what other people say. That's entirely different. So we, we're on the track to ruin our status as academics even more unless we take a different turn. Yeah, thank you. Is that maybe uh, the definition of dialogue that you talk on the basis of values and exploring hidden assumptions, which is so different from debate with winners and losers and uh, asking for opinions? Or would that be the wrong summary? No, I go along, of course, I think that that uh, sort of the, and, and, and again, I mean, if you look at the sort of predominant formats in which we discuss COVID, I mean, really what you can see, the media have made it, sorry, Ulrike, I'm going to uh, say the media did something wrong, but they made it into a horse race yet again. They make everything into a horse race. Who is winning? We or, or the virus, you know? And, and or which country is doing it better? That seems to be the only way in which they can give meaning and mm -hmm. we should resist that. Yes. But I, sorry, uh, Ulrike, before we go to the media, I, I would turn back to ourselves as, as scientists and uh, uh, or go back to what, what we can do, huh? because I, uh, uh, I got stuck with the term organic scientist uh, that you just uh, coined, uh, Martin which means that you are a kind of, uh, uh, I mean, embedded really in your environment. Huh? And so, and in that sense, also managing closeness and distance, huh? you could say, uh, especially the closeness maybe, but I would uh, be very skeptical maybe uh, about how uh, this scientist would be appreciated by his own institution, uh, the university or research institutes, because isn't that, the biggest problem, have we talk about integrating facts uh, with values, emotions, uh, and, and diving into them rather than separating them. But uh, how 
fruitful, no, not how fruitful, but how realistic is that from an institutional perspective? So what uh, would have to change institutionally? But can I jump in yes. here? Because in one of the, the question or answer, I can't remember a question block, I can't remember anymore. There was a question like closeness and distance and whether this is the point and if it's not engaged, uh, if it's not, I can't remember exactly how the phrasing was. For me, this is a, for me, this is the point. I don't think for me, it's the oscillation between engagement between going out and going back in so closeness and distance in in all different kinds of directions i think that's the point in academia for me so i don't think that we dissolve into something that is uh, is unclear but to be clear that how important it is to go out and to come back in that sense in a way of having a space in which you can explore and think and then go a, go out and in a way engage and bring these experiences back, et cetera. So I think that would be for me, that's why I speak about closeness and distancing because both are ways of understanding the world. And I think we have to bring them together again and we keep them too much apart. So either you are dissolved and you are the person that explains everything to everybody or you are the person who does your stuff in the lab and does nothing else. Mm. I think we have to, develop space for this oscillation between these different statuses that we are in. And this will make us experience things in an embodied way. Because once you have really engaged with people and have seen your own difficulties to explain things and to make your thoughts clear, et cetera, then you, you start to realize what people struggle with mm -hmm. and what kinds of value matter to them because you don't know which values matter to them. Mm -hmm. You have to kind of hear it in that sense so not speak for them but speak with them in that sense is for me something very interesting but at the same time i think we need to uh, okay now may i stop here yeah so what what, what would um uh, need to happen institutionally uh, i I'm really intrigued by this question because I think there's quite some consensus also in academia uh, uh, about yeah uh, different relations now between facts, values, emotions, but how to um, um, yeah make sure that scientists who want to do that uh, uh, and to bring oscillation into practice, so to speak, uh, how what should change in our institutional environment for that to become true, or is that too difficult a question? Okay, I might start with saying that it might be a difficult question because there are different academic landscapes and different institutional models of promoting science. And I think it's really hard to say uh, like uh, a real uh, solution that would fit all these different cases. But I think that all uh, what sort of um, mediates between our three pitches, uh, to my view, is that there is a need for a transdisciplinary dialogue. So a certain recognition that there is not one science that would actually explain the problem, but rather this is a sort of a, be it a patchwork or a puzzle from different points. So then taking it back to the example of Martins and media, we've seen that not only it was a horse race, but it was an economic and a medical problem. And mm -hmm. I think we should break that. We should break that and we should acknowledge that our problems that we are confronted with as societies are not only medical and economic problems, they're also psychological problems, sociological problems, environmental problems, and all these things go together. And I think if we, if we, uh, I think that one thing to do would be actually to implement that in the media or in the PR departments of universities that they also, when they represent the scientist solutions and grants and make portraits of scientists, that they actually do not focus on these linear uh, solo disciplinary pathways, but rather show how the diversity of data has created a new knowledge and contributed to what we know about a problem. And that also a non-linearity is a part of science that we sometimes uh, jump over something and then completely change because I think that's also what has been bothering people. And we saw it in the, in the part before in discussing that this sort of, uh, there is one tiny part of conspiracy theory that plays with actually a systematic doubt, which is a part of science. And we have not solved rhetorically and even institutionally the problem, how to actually make people understand that these things are two different things. That of course, in, uh, in science, there is ambivalence, there is ambiguity, there is a surprise. But that's something different. So I 
I guess this would be for me so sort of ways that you could do uh, in different kind of institutional landscapes, if you will. Yeah, when I, uh, Martin, you want to add to that? Or? Yeah, well, you asked what, what we could do institutionally, I think. Mm. So uh, open up also in the big institutions that, that are now responsible for, for communication and to represent science like ARVM and others, open up for experiments in, in how to do that mm -hmm. uh, and, and not, in, not, not follow the predominant model, just make it into an experimental space where, where we have different, where we can create different relations. It would be one thing, for instance, if academics or experts would start their contributions with, uh, with a, a, a statement that make people acknowledge he understands or she understands what I'm concerned about, mm -hmm. instead of explaining that everybody's wrong, but to, to really take seriously that you understand the other person that you speak to, rather than to educate people. Mm -hmm. These sort of formats, they have to be developed. And I think we need an experimental space, not on the COVID, but the COVID should be the reason to do that so that we're prepared for the next mm -hmm. sort of uh, imminent uh, crisis in which again, experts can have a meaningful role, but then hopefully less hampered by the formats that we implicitly all are uh, expected to follow. Yeah, would this also be the main way to, I would almost say, restore trust in in the role or the meaningful role of science for society? So not in science per se, but as a is is this the main route to get a more meaningful science? Eh? Because maybe people trust science when they fill out, out the surveys, eh? as we heard in the first part of this meeting. But do they consider science then also meaningful eh, for how they live their life and how we make policy? So that to me is a different question, eh? how to make science meaningful. So is this the main way to, to uh, in, incorporate diversity, for example, in expert committees, but also with, uh, uh, with all sorts of different actors from society, certainly not only? I'm, I'm not no? sure that that, that that is it exactly. So if, if you think of the climate crisis that, that, that I'm working on right now, so the, I mean, it's not about restoring trust in science. It's about having science in a debate so that society can find solutions mm -hmm. and that is where what, what, what Jorgen touched upon in the beginning eh, where these citizen for our mini publics were so interesting over in Ireland in France and also in the Netherlands we found that in in those very simple experimental contexts in which people could relate to expertise in a way that they could more or less control themselves they were willing to do far more radical steps towards climate uh, policy that works than politics is able to. So I would rather say we have to find formats that help us address major social issues that we are facing in yeah. our day and age. And, and that science can fulfill its role in that context. Yeah. And, and, and the problem is not necessarily with the science, it's with the formatting between politics, uh, consensus formation and, and, and defining the, the issues at hand. Yeah, that seems like a, a nice conclusion because we are already um, almost, uh, we have to finish. Uh, like uh, we started with the issue is uh, when science is contested, what can we do about it? But maybe the contestation or the source of the contestation is not in the science per se or in the science itself, uh, but uh, should be in the role of science for uh, for the solution of uh, societal problems and so we sh start with the the concern at hand with the societal problem of at hand rather than teaching about science per se is that how i can um, summarize it or would you like to add something urgent ulrike Maybe we can think of it as problem solution packaging and thinking about that we, we also share the problem framing uh, more collectively and not allow science to frame the problem and then maybe yeah. together to find a solution, but to really go into the process of problem solution packaging in a way and yeah. to think about what is our collective problem and then different things can have their place in it. And then we also have to find adequate solutions. That would be my maybe uh, yeah. little summary. 
if I take it away. I think that is uh, crucial important, crucially important uh, that uh, already in the defining, uh, the definition of the problem, of course, uh, which was uh, very prominent in the beginning of the COVID crisis, and it still is, it was framed as a medical problem, which it surely is, but it is not only a medical problem. Huh? So already in the problem definitions, uh, the role of science uh, becomes uh, uh, important and visible, and we should all, uh, uh, it's, it's not the science per se that matters here, but uh, the problem definition as a whole, which is important. Um, I think we uh, have now come to the conclusion of this meeting. It goes, has gone very quickly. I would like to thank uh, all the speakers, not only uh, the speakers in the, in the second part of this meeting, but also certainly in the first part of this meeting. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. And, uh, and I also saw that a lot of the questions have been answered already. But let me uh, point out um, uh, again that it is um, uh, the case that um, we will collect all the different um, uh, all the different chats and, and contributions uh, you have made, so nothing is lost. Uh, uh, we collect uh, it and uh, we will implement uh, today's discussion, as well as the question and comments from the audience in our report, which is planned uh, medio 2022. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, this will uh, provide a, a beautiful uh, summary of what we uh, added today. And let me uh, conclude by saying that our next meeting is on December the 2nd. So that is the second in the series of four on uh, science, the role, the impact of the COVID crisis on science and the role of science for society. And this one will be about the impact of, on, of the pandemic on researchers. And you can sign up for that now. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, did I miss something? Uh, should I add something? No? Okay, then I thank you all and uh, uh, let me, yeah, hopefully we'll see you again in the next uh, meetings.